And so again, we want to welcome all of you viewing this conference by live stream video all across the planet. We have quite a few from Australia, from Europe, UK, and North and South America. So we want you to know that we welcome you here as well. And so those of you in the audience today, we do have over 500 people in physical attendance that have come from all parts of the planet as well, and we thank you for coming. Our next speaker, Andrew Collins, is really one of the true Indiana Joneses that has made some remarkable discoveries. He is a brilliant writer, a great collection of books that are available. Andrew, your website is www.andrewcollins.com. Yeah. And so he has uh, great collections of books available there. He has a few still available in the Earthkeeper bookstore. And uh, this next topic is absolutely fascinating. You don't want to miss this. Uh, you're going to be glued to your seats. But he is talking about the underground world beneath the pyramids. Many of you are probably aware that Edgar Cayce said there are three locations on the planet of the Hall of Records and that one of them is beneath the pyramids. Well, the gentleman that is about to talk has been involved in some of those searches along with the Edgar Casey group with Dr. Greg Little, Dr. Laura Little, and John Van Auken. This is an amazing presentation. A big earth keeper round of applause for Andrew Collins. Uh, good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, a recap, if I may. Uh, obviously, I'm sure most, if not all, of you were here for my lecture yesterday. Well, what I'm doing here in many ways is a part two, but just in case you weren't here, there's just a, a, a little recap, if we can. Uh, we talked about, right, we talked about a place called Gebekli Tepe. It's the oldest stone temple complex in the world dates to 11,500 uh, years. It's on a mountain top in southeast Turkey. 
Uh, almost certainly, as Graham Hancock was saying, and obviously I said yesterday, it's the remnant of some kind of lost civilization, uh, probably the result of local people coming together to, to, to create this, but under the control or influence of an elite, uh, an elite that seems to have had the knowledge and the wisdom to be able to construct these type of complexes in the first place. And this is what you see, these incredible uh, circular structures with these T-shaped stones with, um, with beautiful carvings of animals. Some of them are anthropomorphic, they're human-like in appearance. But what we also found is that they are precision aligned towards the stars. Um, in particular, the bright star Deneb in the constellation of Cygnus, the celestial bird or the celestial swan. Um, and they seem to be very specifically aligned towards the setting of these stars as they hit the horizon. Deneb and the stars of Cygnus um, are positioned on the Milky Way where it splits, bifurcates or forks, uh, to form what's known as the Great Rift or the Dark Rift. And this point has been seen as a point of entry and exit into the sky world, into the afterlife, into heaven for many, many thousands of years. And recently, a tiny bone plaque was discovered at Gebekli Tepe that seems to further this connection with Cygnus. Because on the top of this plaque, um, for some reason, uh, there are these deep peck marks, and they reflect exactly the positions of the three so-called wing stars of Cygnus as they appeared in the epoch of the construction of the monuments around 9000 BC. And also on this bone plaque are these twin pillars, T-shaped pillars, just like those actually in the enclosures themselves. Um, and this, as I showed you this yesterday, we won't go with all the music for it, but this essentially is what the artist would have seen when he or she was depicting all of this and carving and making this little etching on this tiny bone plaque, no more than two inches in height. Uh, and obviously there's the, the, the three stars of Cygnus above us. Now Cygnus is important, not just simply because it's a swan, but in a bird in general, because it was seen as a soul bird. A soul bird that brought souls into the world, just like the stalk in uh, modern traditions in, in Europe and probably uh, in many other parts of the world, I'm sure here in the United States. But in many, in many areas of, of Europe, it was the swan that brought the new souls of the children in, and they would carry the old souls of those who had died back to heaven, which was located in the north in the constellation of Cygnus. So that's basically where we were at yesterday, because Cygnus is a point of creation in the universe. It was seen as not just where everything began, but somewhere beyond it was the access point into the afterlife. Um, and this we find also in ancient Egypt. And now we'll turn our attentions with just a little bit of how the ancient Egyptians saw the concept of the soul because they had various different aspects of the soul. But two of the most primary forms were, were the so-called car and bar. Now, these were twin souls. Um, and it was believed, you can see here, this is the, the god um, Anubis, the, the, uh, the jekyll-headed god. This is the deceased in the form of the mummy. And hovering over the deceased is the bird here. Now, this is the, uh, the bar, I believe that's right. Um, yeah, the soul itself, and the divine spark was the car. This was the thing that animated the body. And it was believed that in death, these two aspects, the bar and the car, would finally come together to form this, this higher type of spirit, often known as the glorious spirit, known as the Ak, the A-K-H, as in the pharaoh Akhenaton. Um, and... This was represented in hieroglyphic form by the so-called crested ibis. And the ibis is a very, very important bird. I mean, firstly, it was said in the pyramid texts and various other ancient Egyptian um, works 
uh, uh, Books of the Dead, that once the pharaoh um, went through this underworld known as the Duat, he would rise up and become at one with the stars of the northern sky and become an Ak or Aku. Aku is the, uh, the plural of it. Now, the Ak, as I said, is the ibis. It's the ultimate symbol of the soul in ancient Egypt, but it's also the symbol of the god Thoth, or Thoth, okay? And Thoth has many roles. He's the god of the moon, he's the keeper of records, but he's also the judge of the soul in the afterlife. In other words, when the deceased gets into the netherworld, he has to account for his actions in the, the physical reality. And based on this, he will either be allowed to continue on into the afterlife, or his soul will be eaten by this, this hideous monster that's half crocodile and half hippo, um, which will, you know, his soul will... will, will Will, will be torn apart, and that's the end of him. So you've got to be pretty righteous, and your soul was wa wa weighed against a feather, the feather of truth. And it was Thoth that did this, but there's an important clue here as to who Thoth is. Because in Native American tradition, which I mentioned yesterday, the soul would jump into the sky, enter the Milky Way via Orion, and would then go around the Milky Way to the point where the Milky Way splits into forks, bifurcates, and here he would meet a raptor, a bird-headed figure, who had the name, the charming name of Brain Smasher. I, I, I kid you not, this is what it is in Native America, this is the translation. And Brain Smasher uh, would, again, judge the soul, either righteous um, or sinful, if it was righteous, it would be able to cross a bridge and enter the afterlife beyond Cygnus. Or if it wasn't, it would be plunged into the void, just like in ancient Egypt, and be eaten by a monster which was equated with the constellation of Scorpio. Anyway, um, so what we're saying here, I think, is that Thoth almost certainly was the Egyptian form of this. So the ibis... Uh, and Thoth as well, is very much associated with Cygnus and the Milky Way. And Thoth, as the ibis, was also the bird of creation. Um, and uh, it was said that the ibis laid the cosmic egg that became the universe, um, and that this was laid from a position in the Milky Way, which underlines this idea that Thoth and the ibis were again associated with Cygnus. Now, the soul of the pharaoh in ancient Egyptian tradition in death was said to become at one with the god Osiris. In, in other words, he would take on this form um, because obviously uh, the pharaohs themselves were seen to be divine. In life they were the god Horus but as soon as they died they became the god Osiris. Um, and to achieve this, this rebirth the pharaoh in the form of Osiris had to re-enter the cosmic womb of his mother. And his mother was Nuit. And the way that he would do this is that the, the, the deceased would be placed inside a coffin, inside a sarcophagus, um, inside a tomb, and often, uh, obviously in the early periods, inside a pyramid. And all of these were representations of the cosmic womb. Um, of the goddess Nuit, who we can see here. Now, we talked about this yesterday, but it's important that we go over it again. Um, and she was the personification of the Milky Way, and her cosmic womb was in the area of Cygnus, and it was seen that this was the area that the, the pharaoh gained rebirth upon entering the afterlife, okay? So once again, the, we, the emphasis here is on Cygnus. He's born from the cosmic womb of Nuit, i.e. Cygnus, and he gains his rebirth in exactly the same position as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, in other words, what he's doing is he's going back in reverse. In other words, he, he's born from an embryo, is born into this world, and to return to the afterlife, he's got to do everything in reverse, essentially. Okay, now... Now we're at Giza. 
The Giza pyramids are aligned to the stars, clearly. Uh, it's something that I've mentioned yesterday, and obviously uh, Graham Hancock talked about as well. And my friend and colleague, uh, Robert Bouval, talks very much about the stars of Orion being associated with the geographical positioning of the three Giza pyramids. Now, we have a certain little rivalry going on relating this, because I believe that they align perfectly to the constellation of Cygnus, and that the three wing stars of Cygnus, Gainar, Sadia, and uh, Ruach, or Delta Cygni, match perfectly the geographical positions of the three main pyramids, pyramids, the Great Pyramid, the Second Pyramid, the Third Pyramid, okay? And whereas the Orion correlation is something that, that may have been created and then forgotten about in some ways as far as, as what you can do with it afterwards, if you use Cygnus, all sorts of interesting stuff becomes apparent. The most fascinating and the most amazing of which is the fact that from a certain position, just beyond the Giza Plateau, you can see the same three stars, the same three wing stars of Cygnus, set down perfectly into their respective pyramids. And I'll show you how this works. Uh, and this is something that, that, that my, um, my, my colleague, uh, Rodney Hale, uh, a, a British chartered engineer, has done a lot of work on, and he's looked at this very finely, very carefully, and it worked perfectly. Um, now, the three pyramids are actually in an arc, and if you find the center of that arc, it takes you to a spot about a mile and a half towards the southeast of the plateau, okay? And if you continue on that line until you reach 2,900 meters, which is about 1.8 miles, this is the spot that you can see these three stars sitting down. And this is exactly what happens. Look. Right, that's exactly, we'll do that again maybe, let's have a look at that again. This is exactly what you would have seen in around 2500 BC from that spot. You'd have seen the three stars sit perfectly down into their respective pyramids. I don't think that this was a coincidence. And what's interesting is that the location where this takes place as I said, about 1.8 miles to the southeast of the plateau is also a highly significant spot. Because on old maps, it's marked as Bucyrus. Okay, here's the pyramids there on this old map. There's the three pyramids. And there's this place called Bucyrus. And Bucyrus actually is a Greek rendering of a, uh, an ancient Egyptian uh, word which means the house or place of Osiris. Uh, and this is intriguing because there are stories that, uh, that in the vicinity of the Giza Plateau, in the area of what's known as Upper Rostau, um, which is in the area that we're talking about, that Osiris is buried in something called the Shetiat. Now, Shetiat means the house of God. Um, and some people believe that it's some kind of primeval mound, um, and that this could be where Osiris is actually buried. Now, whether this is right or not, I don't know, but what's very interesting is that the exact spot where you would stand, there is actually a mound. The contours show there is exactly a mound, which could have been an observational point. Maybe it is some kind of remnant of a primeval mound, we can't be sure because we'll, we'll probably never get the, uh, the chance to, uh, you know, to excavate there. But I just want to point all these in, in things out because you know, I don't think any of this is, is coincidence. There's something going on here. So with what I'm going to show you next, you know, this also is something that must be important. Because if we go back to the plateau itself and the actual Cygnus correlation, the three stars, as I said, represent the three pyramids. But what about the other main stars of Cygnus, right? Let's look at this one here called Alberio. Now it falls on a hill to the southeast of the plateau known as Jebel Ghibli. Now this just, sub, this just means the southern hill. Uh, and here it is here. 
Um, and these are the stars, and this is Cygnus overlaid on the, uh, the, the pyramids there. Now, this place called Jebel Ghibli is very, very significant. I mean, it's often referred to as the fourth pyramid because it juts out right on the edge of, of the Giza Plateau. And the local name for it was Tafaya, and this means the place of the beginning. Uh, and I think that the reason for this is twofold. Firstly, the Sphinx, which uh, is just to the, the north of there, there is a stone stealer known as the Dream Stealer right in front of it that talks a place called, uh, some, somewhere known as the Splendid Place of the First Time, and it talks about it to the south. And I'm pretty certain that it's referring to Jebel Ghibli. Um, and there's no question that Jebel Ghibli is almost certainly the original survey point of the plateau. In other words, the entire um, plateau, the pyramid field, was probably constructed from this point outwards. This was the original survey point that was used. Uh, and in fact, has been recently used by the Giza Mapping, mapping Project and also by ourselves. That's myself and my colleague uh, Nigel Skinner Simpson, who I'll introduce you to in a minute, uh, doing some survey work there, doing, doing our own work, checking out all of this. So that's, that's the star Alberio, which is down here. But what about the main star of Cygnus, Deneb, the brightest star? There should obviously be something very, very important there. Well, here it is. It's right in the sorry up here, right in the northwest part of the plateau, somewhere that people don't generally ever go if they visit the monuments of the Giza Plateau. So, what's actually there? Well, something not that exciting. It's a mastaba tomb. Now, these were these were stone, um, you know, structures with with earth within them, with with, with deep pits leading to chambers that were the tombs of the nobles, the officials, the priests, around the time of Khufu and the other um, old kingdom or fourth dynasty kings that ruled and supposedly created the pyramids that we have and see today. Now this was a little bit of a disappointment because I thought, you know, maybe there should be something important there. But I remember talking to somebody at the time and they said, well, that's good, isn't it? I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, quite clearly there's probably something beneath the plateau at this point. And it may actually be that the, ne the Deneb point, as we come to refer to it, is the entrance into some kind of cave underworld. And I, and I said to this person who was my, my literary agent at the time, I said, I said, that's just too good to be true. But I said, I like that. I like that idea. So that's a great idea. Um, for the simple reason that there have been traditions at Giza, going back to the time of the pharaohs, and in Roman times, in Arab uh, times, right the way through to the modern day, about some kind of hidden chamber or structure or cave system or tunnel system existing beneath the plateau. Indeed, the ancient name of Giza was Rostau, um, and this means the entrance or mouth into the passages or caves. In other words, the actual name of the Giza Plateau was a reference to the fact that it was an entrance into some kind of cave underworld. Now, obviously, Egyptologists saw this as symbolic, but I was beginning to wonder whether there was really something there. Now, various psychics, as we know, have talked about the idea of a hidden chamber beneath the plateau. One was this guy called H. Randall Stevens, um, who, who believed that there was an entrance to this halls of initiation uh, beneath the, the, the Sphinx. And, of course, our dear friend Edgar Casey talked about three halls of records around the world, one of which he believed was somewhere in the vicinity of the Sphinx and that there was probably a, um, an entrance in the vicinity of the right poor, uh, and over the last 70 years, an awful lot of time and effort and research has gone into looking for the entrance into the Hall of Records. Most of it uh, sponsored, of course, by the, um, the Edgar Casey Foundation and their research ring, the Association for Research and Enlightenment. 
Um, and, you know, some very interesting things have been found, obviously cavities in this vicinity. But the problem with the area around the Sphinx is that the water table beneath it is very close to the surface. It's only about two or three meters down, two or three yards. So whenever you try and do anything beneath it, you're going to hit water. And the Nile was much closer to the Sphinx in the past. And it becomes obvious that this doesn't seem to be the most obvious place that you're going to put some kind of hall of records if you know the water's nearby and you know the water table might rise up. Just possibly it could be somewhere else on the plateau or certainly the main chamber. Maybe there is an entrance here. Who knows? Maybe there's multiple entrances. These were ideas that were going through my head. Plus, as I said, the ancient Egyptians themselves actually talked about some kind of, of underground thing going on. They talked about it under the name um, the Duat. Now, the Duat was seen to be this, this, this cave underworld that the pharaoh had to navigate before he could rise up out of this, almost like the sun rising at dawn, and going up into the sky and becoming at one with the stars as, as an ack, like this, this, this soul bird, the ibis. Um, so, you know, the, 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 something was going on here, and I embarked probably a beginning around 2005, on my own personal search to find what Edgar Casey referred to as the Hall of Records. Okay. And I went there, I found one entrance, there was a well very close to Jebel Ghibli, which is where I'm standing on now, just down here there's a well which, you know, there's stories about it being an entrance, but we couldn't take that any further. And then I started to work with this gentleman here, Nigel Skinner Simpson. Now, this guy is a British Egyptological researcher who is an incredible, brilliant mind, has read virtually every book that's ever been written on um, the Giza Plateau. I mean, we're talking about obscure academic stuff, and every paper, every essay, every article, he knows the place like the back of his hand. And, you know, we would chat and that, he would come round, have a cup of tea, and bring some biscuits around and we sit down and talk about things. And one day he brought round uh, an old map. And it was done by a gentleman called John Shea Perring. He was a British engineer um, who actually worked with uh, a British explorer known as Colonel Howard Weiss. In, they did a lot of work on the Giza Plateau, some of it a bit explosive. They tried to blow a hole in the Great Pyramid uh, uh, to their shame, but um, anyway, they did some great work, and Perring did an incredible map of the plateau, and, and it's been double-checked, and it's very, very accurate even to this day. And the Deneb spot, right, where the Mastaba uh, Lepsius 14 was, that you saw a picture of, is there, okay? But then I was very intrigued to see what this was down here, which is something I'd never seen before on any map. And it was this strange crescent with what appeared to be like these underground structures. And it said, excavated tombs and pits of bird mummies. And I said to Nigel, I said, have you ever come across this before? He said, no. So well, what is this? I said, you know, this, this appears to be something that was going on in the northwest corner of the plateau that we don't know anything about. And so Nigel went away and he checked and he found that there was, there was only one reference to this, and it was in the diary account of uh, Colonel Howard Weiss, you can see there, and basically it just talked about the Mick going into the tomb in 1837 and finding bird mummies, and it's, it mentions specifically uh, um, a very large bird mummy was removed on this day. Um, and it, it's, it referred to them going into uh, chambers and galleries. So this was obviously quite an extensive place. But what Nigel was also able to confirm is that there was no other mention of this tomb anywhere, not in any modern book, which seemed to be a gross oversight, quite clearly. But this obviously just intrigued us more. So what was all these, what was this, these bird mummies then? Well, the most obvious bird that it was, and almost certainly this is the answer, is that they were mummified ibises. Um, and the ibis, obviously, we've already talked about in terms of the god Thoth. 
Um, and he obviously was the judge of the dead. The dead had to pass through this, 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 this underworld, this cave world called the Duat. And we also know that obviously the Ibis was connected with Cygnus. So suddenly I'm thinking this site could be very, very, very important. And um, clearly this place which we started to refer to as the Tomb of the Birds was the center of a cult connected with the god Thoth and that people probably right the way down to Roman times would mummify birds, ibises, and make them as offerings to the god Thoth by going in this tomb and placing them in there and leaving them there and obviously therefore gaining the favor of, of the god possibly you know for their deceased or when they themselves died or whatever. And here we, have, we did find a, 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 a closer image or you know much more close-up image done by by John Perring and here it is. Look, here's the entrance and here's quite a, a substantial structure here. Okay? So clearly we wanted to find this place, find out if it existed still. And so we looked on the map and finally we found it. It was in the northwest corner. These are the cliffs right in the northwest corner. This is an area that people don't go. There was a presidential building very close to it that was used by uh, President Mubarak um, during his time of presidency, and it was a no-go area. The helicopters would come from Cairo, and they would land there. He would spend some time there, and he would go back. So nobody would ever, was ever allowed in that corner. However, that fell into disuse. It was then just used by a few engineers, and, but nobody still went there, and you weren't, I mean, it wasn't that you weren't officially allowed there, but just they didn't really encourage anyone to go further west, really, than the Third Pyramid. Um, and so, you know, it, it was a sort of grey area, if you like. Uh, and we'll talk about these grey areas as we go on. Um, and this is what the Tomb of the Bird looks like from a hotel room where I was staying, because we finally went there in 26th of January 2007. And I say we, this was myself and my ex-wife, Sue. And we went into the tomb. That's what the, the entrance looked like. It's a huge, great tomb entrance. And so we went inside it. And there's me inside it, looking around at all the rubbish there. And sure enough, we found on the walls all these, like, these letter boxes. I mean, some of them were quite small. Some of them were very large inside there. And clearly, these are where the bird mummies were actually placed. So they'd have been put in the wall and probably covered up. Uh, and at some point in antiquity, uh, the tomb was found and they were removed and, and that was that. So this was certainly confirmation. And the reason why you've got small ones is that they're not for birds. They're for small animals that would have been given as offerings to the spirit of the ibis. Okay, like little mice or shrews or something like this. Birds that would have been seen to be eaten by those birds. Okay, so there's me inside it. Um, there's, there's another chamber going off the side. Clearly, this did not look like what John Perrin had actually created. And we searched it. Bearing in mind it was in pitch darkness, so we had a, a torch trying to search around in there. Couldn't find any entrance to what I now believed could be a deeper level, perhaps even an entrance into some kind of cave system. That's what I genuinely believed by this time. But, you know, it's a quest, it's, it's a game, isn't it? You do it and, you, you know, you hope that something's going to come out of it. You know, there's a certain amount of fantasy involved, but you go along with it hoping that, that something good's going to come out of this. So we came away from there and thought, well, where to next? Well, that was in 2007 in January. And over the coming year, there were a number of clues that suggested that this place had to be important. One of which was the fact that my, my good friend Rodney Hale, the chartered engineer, found that a perfect um, uh, triangle going through the, the peaks of the second, first and second pyramid and the top of Jebel Ghibli, right, crossed in the northwest corner within a few yards of the Tomb of the Birds. And I thought, this is just, this is too coincidental. And that obviously a line went perfectly from Jebel Ghibli through the peak of the Second Pyramid to the Tomb of the Birds. Again, suggesting that it was important. But it was then that I 
that Nigel came up with something which changed everything. Um, and we met in a cafe uh, opposite the British Museum. Um, we'd, we'd been doing some research in there. And we came out and we sat and he said, I found something of interest. He said that in 1817, uh, this guy here, Henry Salt, who was the British consul to Egypt at the time, and an explorer who would employ the services of mostly Italian um, strong men and, and, and explorers in their own right, uh, was exploring the Giza Plateau itself with this guy called Giovanni Caviglia. Um, and they entered inside, it, it said, and this, this was a diary account that had only just been published for the first time ever. I mean, you know, within a, a matter of weeks. So this was not available the previous year. And that in 1817, Salt and Cavigula entered catacombs at Giza and travelled for a distance of several hundred yards before coming upon a spacious chamber linking with three others of equal size. The catacombs' entrance were located in area QQ on Salt's plan. Well, Nigel reconstructed Salt's plan, which wasn't easy, I can promise you, and eventually found that area QQ was in precisely the area of the Tomb of the Birds. Now, this was unique discovery because the commentators the, who, who had published, uh, on behalf of the British Museum, the diary accounts, the memoirs of Henry Salt, had actually said, oh, Area QQ must be somewhere to the north of the Great Pyramid, um, or whatever. They got it completely wrong. Nigel got it right. He worked out exactly where it was. So, I said, it's got to be there. I said, we missed it. We missed it inside the Tomb of the Birds. We've got to go back. And so, we actually uh, contacted the ARE. I knew John Van Alken. And, uh, you know, I asked them if they would come on board for us to try and find the entrance to the Hall of Records. And they said, of course. So, with um, a certain amount of sponsorship from the ARE, myself... Um, XY Sue and Nigel Skinner Simpson went back to the Giza Plateau on the 3rd of March 2008. Now, we went on camels. The reason we went on camels is because we didn't want to go through the normal entrances with a whole load of caving gear because it would have been very suspicious, okay? So we thought the best thing that we can do is to get camels go in by what was then the southern entrance into the plateau, which was through a fence, which was perfectly legal, by the way. And, no, no, I'm serious, it was. I mean, you know, that's how people got on to the plateau if you wanted to go on a camel, okay, and have a ride round. Now, you cannot do that anymore. Um, but, so, also, we realised that if we were on camels, we, there would be less likely to be stopped by the tourist police. I'm serious, that, that's what we thought. If we were wandering towards the northwest corner of the plateau. So we went there, and obviously went back to the Tomb of the Birds, and we went inside, and this time we did find something, a small crack inside one of the, the, the chambers right at the end. And here's the first of, of two little videos that records that moment. of the bird cult. Very, very big. Not sure how old it is. I'm now switching to night vision. Ooh, interesting aroma in here. Bats, go on. This is the way that it comes in. More from the canvas here. Here. And in here they found lots of mummified birds. Ah, wow. well, here's the rest of your two little birds. Wow! Oh my god! That's amazing! Okay, well that genuinely was the moment of discovery. That's uh, so uh, voicing her uh, excitement over this. And this was the, the small little entrance. It's a small crack. Um, within the like a, a stone area, which had actually been um, 
uh, walled up at some point and then broken down again, probably in antiquity, probably in Roman times. Well, I'll come back to why that is in a moment. So, we stand at the precipice now, entering into this, and this is the first site of the, the cave underworld at Giza. And bear in mind that nobody knew this was there. The last people that had gone into this was Henry Salt and, and Caviglia in 1817. Now, Perring and uh, Weiss may have seen this, but they didn't venture any further, otherwise they would, have, they would have recorded it on their map. And this was how we entered. Now, there was a huge opening chamber, which we called the dome, massive chamber. And it was natural, but it had been partly hewn out. They'd obviously tried to make it rectangular in form and, and failed, so just left it. But then in the southern part of it, there were various other sort of sub-entrances going off in different directions, most of which didn't go anywhere eventually. But we found the southern entrance, and this did lead into a long cave chamber. And I'm going to show you various pictures of this as we, as we go along now. Uh, it's me uh, going into uh, the north-south cave passage. Now, look how red the rock is here. And this is what's known as ochre. It's basically um, iron oxide, which was very, very sacred to peoples in ancient times. They saw it as, as a representation of lifeblood. Um, and many uh, burials from the Paleolithic era and the Neolithic era all around the world have been found sprinkled with, with red ochre. And I think this is very significant. Um, that's me navigating the north-south passage. Uh, and there's a uh, so inside it. Look, look at this black as well. Very smooth. And let's point out that the, this is treacherous inside here. Um, there are huge blocks every pace of the way. It's pitch black. Um, it's stiflingly hot, um, and there are huge blocks. All these blocks have fallen from the ceiling, probably through earthquakes over probably tens of thousands of years. Um, and as I say, pitch black. So the only way that we know what, what, where we're going is through the, the poor flashlights that we've got uh, and obviously the flashes of cameras that we're going. I'm trying to also record it uh, on video as well. And the other thing is that it's full of bats. Thousands of them, and just to make it even more friendly in there, white widows. And get bitten by one of them, and you'll certainly know it, and that would be the end of your quest to discover Giza's <laughs> cave underworld. Um, and other bugs, which I don't even want to describe, basically. Um, and so we actually went in twice in March 2008, and then went back in April that year. Uh, and this time covered up a lot better, as you can see there. Still rather makeshift, but um, it did the trick. Uh, and of course, the idea was to penetrate deeper and deeper and see where this went. Um, and there's me doing just that. Um, and what's interesting is that eventually, all of the rocks that fall from the ceiling disappear, and there's a perfect path, a perfect route through it. And, you know, it's, it's just incredible. Uh, they are, yes, yes, but please, please don't see them as spirits. There's just so much dust in there um, that it's, it, it, you know, and not just dust, but guano, which is bat dung, basically. And bat dung is poisonous. Um, you can get diseases off that that can kill you. Let's point this out. And there are other problems as well in here. Carbon um, dioxide poisoning um, in deep caves with the, 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 the low amounts of oxygen, high content of carbon dioxide, which I think at certain points we may have even started to suffer. And it's, it's very difficult to breathe in them as well. It's so hot, so stifling. But now let's point these out, that these caves are prehistoric in origin. They're probably tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years old. Um, they are, they are, there's nothing in them. Right? There's no hieroglyphs. No artifacts other than a couple of, of remnants of mummies that we came across, uh, which we, you know, we just, I picked up one and put it straight back down, didn't do any excavating, didn't do anything at all. Um, and eventually, you push and you get right to the end of this north-south passage, and there's a, there's a passage off to the left. And um, inside this, this, this passage to the left, there is markings, these, these, these strange uh, yeah, peck marks, you know, the, the, like uh, parallel lines. 
And although they might be seen as um, practical, maybe they just shave chamfering off some, some edging on a wall, they go underneath walls, and there's no reason for that, which tends to suggest that they have some kind of symbolic or ritual function. But this was the only real evidence of carving that, that we actually did find in there, uh, uh, other than a, a, a strange head, which I'll show you shortly. In fact, it's here, because it's so there. And just have a look at that. The strange face here, I mean, this could be what we call simulacra, OK? But it's fascinating anyway. You can see the nose, you can see the eyes, you can see the headdress. Is this some kind of Atlantean priest? Who knows? Maybe. Or maybe, as I say, it's simulacra. But certainly it was very strange, something which, uh, um, you know, I noticed afterwards. In fact, we noticed so much afterwards in the photograph, far more than what we did whilst we were actually in there. And we travelled for a distance of possibly around 150 yards. And it was just getting impossible to get any further. And right at the end of it, there is what we called the tube. And this sank down into a, a hole, probably no more than about a yard across, that got even smaller. And I remember doing this and pointing it in and seeing all these bugs in there, like something out of an Indiana Jones film, and thinking, maybe it's not the right time to go any further. <laughs> maybe, just maybe. And I live to regret that decision for reasons which we'll come on to. Um, and where it went, I didn't know, obviously. And we came out of it. And hold on, sorry. Uh, we'll come to him in a minute. We'll come to him in a minute. And this was the plan that I did of it when we came out. I came straight out and did a plan from memory as accurately as possible based on all the photographs. There's the Tomb of the Birds. There's, there's that. That's how you get into it. That's the train jabber. And that's the tube where we got there. Okay, so that's, that's that. Now, our good friend, Zawi Hawassa, of course, you can all boo and hiss if you wish. <laughs> but let's say one thing, though. I mean, yes, he is like some kind of what we call a pantomime dame, you know, the bad guy in, in the story. But, there's, you know, there's, there's some interesting things here. I mean, he, he, ha he, he plays a role in this, which is quite crucial as to what comes next. Because firstly, John Van Olken, who at the, certainly at the time was a good friend of, of Zoe Hawass. I mean, Zoe would uh, meet ARE tours in Giza and talk to them or whatever. There was, there was a working relationship between the ARE and, um, and Zoe Hawass, which probably to some degree continues to this day. Because a, a lot of his um, bravado is simply that. I mean, you know, he, has to, he, he had to be seen as the strongest man in Egypt. Well, third most important man in Egypt after Mubarak, Omar Sharif, of course. Uh, <laughs> third, it was Zawi Hawass. But a lot of it was bravado. He had to be like this lion, basically. I am in charge. And whereas secretly... You know, he believed that he was a reincarnation of Khufu. He believed in the, 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 the Hall of Records and all the rest of it, which is one of the reasons why the ARE were able to do a lot of work in the area of the Giza Plateau. So we have to give him credit for this. He and obviously Mark Lerner, who was originally um, a student of the ARE and went on to become a world-famous Egyptologist who's still working out there today. So all these people have got connections with the ARE. So John Van Olken told Zoe Hawass what we discovered towards the end of 2008. And whether it sank in or not, I'm not sure, because I felt that we needed to officially now hand this over to the Egyptian authorities. It was, we couldn't do any more. So myself and Sue went to meet Zoe Hawass in his office on the 9th of April 2009. We showed him photographs, we gave him a report that myself and Nigel Skinner-Simpson had done about how we got there, all the facts, all the references. And he just threw up his arms and he said, you know, we know everything about the Giza Plateau. You amateurs cannot come here and, and discover caves. There is no caves at Giza. And he just, he just stopped. And there was a silence. And then there was just a slight smile on his face. And so burst out laughing. She thought it was a joke, which is not what you do in the front of Zabi Hawass. I mean, most of his underlings cower, you know, when he starts having a go at them. 
And at that point, as I say, I got the joke. He has to say this. No matter what we found, he has to say this. Um, and we kept this secret because I was doing a book which came out called Beneath the Pyramids, which is available obviously next door on the ARE stall. And we wanted to keep this secret because we wanted to try and find out everything we could and get it into the book. But eventually it leaked out. And when it leaked onto the internet, it became uh, viral within days. It was, it was featured on Discovery, it was on MSNBC, and all similar news channels all around the world. In fact, even CNN, the, the Middle East correspondent, corresponded me, wanted to interview me, and I later found out was told not to by the Egyptian authorities. Believe it or not, that's a true story. I found that out, that's a fact. Um, so, these are the sort of stories that came out. Cave complex may lie beneath the, the, the Giza Plateau, all the stories, there's pictures of Sue, and obviously one of the pictures here. And then, obviously, Zoe himself gives his official view, come, came out on the Zoe Hawass website, Collins Cave. I have a cave named after my name. Thank you. <laughs> Collins Caves, okay? <laughs> So, and that's honestly, yeah, people did start referring to it as that. I mean, it probably won't go down the official records, but... Um, and this was his official state statement. I can say that there is no underground cave complex at this site. Okay, just remember this because of what we're going to come on to next. Because my colleague Rodney Hale, who keeps up to date with the, uh, the latest Google Earth images of the Giza Plateau, found something interesting going on with the Tomb of the Birds. February 2009, November 2000. Oh, what's all this in front of it? They must be excavating inside it. <laughs> Clearly, Zoe Hawass, after we'd been to see him, went straight on to his people and said, get into that place now and excavate. And in many ways, I'm glad, because they discovered the whole underground area, all the galleries that Weiss and Perrin obviously entered in 1837. And here's a rough plan of what they look like. Here's the entrance. You go down these steps on either side, entering this vast area, massive vast area. But one of the other things that I'd asked Zoe Harass to do, and so one of the reasons we put it, made it official, we said, please put a gate on it because idiots will get in there and do stupid things. And that started to happen, and, and I'm so glad that they did actually put a gate on there. I mean, all right, it keeps everybody out, but that's not the point. I mean, because there is untouched archaeology in here that may go back tens of thousands of years. So we need to preserve that, okay? So that's, I'm quite happy that they actually did that. And that was certainly there by early 2010. Now, this is what happens next. I get to hear that a TV series is being made called Chasing Mummies, which is like a reality show following around Zoe Hawass. And I get a tip off that one of the episodes is going to be about the caves. I think, what? So the next thing we know, this episode called Bats is screened. Um, it was filmed at Giza in December 2008. It was first premiered in the USA on the 1st of September 2010. And Zavi is determined to disprove the theories of the so-called pyramid idiots. That's me and probably you as well. <laughs> Um, who believe that there are secret underground chambers leading to the Sphinx, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this whole episode is about Zoe Hawass and these archaeologists and people going in there and exploring our caves. Remember, those ones that don't exist, remember? Um, and this is David Cheatham, one of the consultant archaeologists, going up the tube, the very tube that we didn't go up. And in the actual episode... You hear him, they, they, you know, Zoe or somebody shouts up, what can you find up there? And he's gone about 20 feet, and he says, nothing, it ends here. And I remember hearing that thinking, oh, well, never mind. But I now know that that's not the case, and that this was false, and it does continue on. I mean, and I mean the actual tube itself. Um, I won't say how I know that, I, I've been sworn to secrecy, but I know it doesn't stop there, and it was just, this was just said for the cameras. And Zoe Hawass, actually whilst he's in there, says these words, I have never made any adventure like this at Giza before. In other words, he's well happy. He's incredible. He didn't even realise 
the extent of these caves. And let's remember what he did say before. I can say that there are no underground cave complex at this site. So somehow he's changed his tune. This is uh, a composite done by Rodney Hale of the opening chamber, what we call the dome of it. Uh, I mean, you can see the size of it. There's me, there's Nigel there. I mean, look at, just look at the size of it. It's incredible. This is just the opening uh, of the thing. But anyway, where do the caves go? Well, we eventually found that this um, satellite known as Terra X that does like this, this um, radar satellite imagery that can look underground had created a map of the Giza Plateau. And when Rodney Hale, the engineer, looked at this, we found that the caves are actually shown on the map. And the Tomb of the Birds is here, and there are two courses that go from there all the way to the second pyramid. Okay? And here it is. Here's part of the map itself. Here's the two lines. But what's so interesting is that they match perfectly fissures in the rock or chambers that had earlier been recorded in 1977 as part of a survey that was done that found that around the perimeter of the northwest end of the west face, anomalies found up to six meters deep, but in this area is heavily faulted. Of course, fault lines is how caves form. What happens is the water goes along fault lines or fissures, and they, they, they carve out caves, and this is obviously exactly what these caves were that we entered. They were created by water, as I said, maybe tens, hundreds, if not maybe even millions of years ago. So we have underground caves or chambers beneath the second pyramid. Not the first pyramid, the Great Pyramid, not the Sphinx, but underneath the second pyramid. So what do these represent and what do they contain? Well, okay. Now, we've talked about Thoth and Ibis. We know that, that, that the caves themselves, or the, certainly the entrances of them, were probably sacred to Thoth. Thoth was the keeper of records. He allowed the, the soul of the deceased to pass through the underworld. He acted as the psychopomp, accompanying the soul, right? Um, and also he was the judge. We know this. Now, in Greek terms... Uh, Thoth is known as Hermes, okay? And Thoth is Hermes, and in Hebrew, his name is Enoch, and in Arabic, he's known as Idris. Just bear this in mind as we, as we carry on. And this is Hermes here. He's known as the thrice great Hermes, okay? So in other words, Thoth becomes Hermes in Greek tradition. And there's a story that Hermes created this thing called the Emerald Tablet, or, which are the secret of Hermes, okay? And then here's a, a, a sort of fantastical version of what it looks like, okay? And it's said that this Emerald Tablet was found by this, this, this Roman philosopher and mystic called Apollonius of Tyana, and it was found at the end of a long underground corridor or tunnel, right, in the bosom of Hermes' body, located in the area of the second pyramid. So right in the very area where these caves end. So not only have we got a cult of Hermes at their beginning, but seemingly where they end is also where Hermes himself was said to be buried. Now what the reality of this burial of is, I don't think we need to worry because it's what the Emerald Tablet represents that's important here. Because the Emerald Tablet decides, uh, describes the ascent to heaven and the return to earth associated with a profound cosmic revelation, associated with Hermes as Enoch or Idris going to the navel of the world to achieve this knowledge and write it on the Emerald Tablet. So where's this navel of the world? Gobekli Tepe means the, nave, the hill of the navel. Is it possible that Hermes is linked with Gebekli Tepe in southeast Tur Turkey? Well, he definitely is. Because the story of the Emerald Tablet forms part of a body of literature which, um, which is known as the Hermetica. And these are the ancient wisdom and knowledge of the Egyptians that was funneled through a place called Haran. Now, Graham Hancock was talking about Haran yesterday. 
Um, and that the Sabians almost certainly were the founders of this tradition of Hermetica. In other words, quite a lot of these ideas may not actually have started in Egypt, but they started in southeast Turkey, just a few miles away from Gebekli Tepe, and may well contain knowledge that would have been passed down many thousands of years. And here's a, a picture of Haran. It was said that Enoch was one of the people that, that founded this, this site. He is um, and the, the, the sacred books of the Sabians, that the people of Haran um, were written here, and that you know, this was a point of foundation for them. And just to the south of Haran, there is a mound. It's actually not this one, but it's in the vicinity of this, called Tel Idris, which means the, 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 the hill of Idris. Um, Idris is the Arabic name of, of Enoch, compounding this connection with Enoch stroke Hermes stroke Idris with this location so close to Gebekli Tepe. And this is 10,000 years old. It dates back to the time of Gebekli Tepe itself. In other words, knowledge and wisdom from Gebekli could easily have come via Tel Idris into the ancient Haranian or Sabian city of uh, Haran. And the reason why this is important, and Graham talked about this last night, is that the Sabians venerated the monuments of the Giza Plateau right the way through until medieval times. They venerated the Sphinx, they venerated the Great Pyramid, and they renovated the Second Pyramid. And they saw the Great Pyramid as the burial place of um, this great father that they, they, they referred to as Agathodemon. And the Second Pyramid they saw as the, the resting place of Hermes. The tomb of Hermes was placed here. Um, and what's interesting is they even had their own village, and it was southeast of the plateau, identical to the area of Bucyrus in this area here, exactly the place where you could see the three stars of Cygnus set down into the pyramids. Now, is that a bit more than a coincidence? And in a complicated way, which I'm not going to go into now, the Sabians venerated the north as the place of the primal courts, and it can be shown that they originally were, were venerators of Cygnus. But also, they talked about the tomb of Hermes being guarded by this great snake or serpent that existed, reposed beneath the plateau itself, guarding the, the tomb of Hermes and Agathodemon. Um, and what's interesting is that in ancient Egyptian tradition, there is also this, this great snake that is said to repose within the duat in an area that's linked with, with Giza specifically. Uh, and this is the great snake, this is um, a form of the god Osiris known as Sokar. And what's this strange, this strange thing here with these two birds on that's also said to be there? Well, I think it's what's known as an omphalos. Now that's a, a navel stone, a stone that was seen to be the center of creation in the physical world and sometimes even the center of creation in the universe as a whole. They're found in Greece, they're found in Egypt, they're found in many ancient countries. The concept of a navel is universal. Con different cultures, different kingdoms, different countries would all have their own. So this is not unique. But I was beginning to wonder whether there was one that existed beneath the plateau at Giza itself. Lingams have the same role in Vedic and Hindu tradition as the, the omphalos. Um, obviously, these are found in underground uh, temples within many Hindu uh, uh, temples themselves, you know, great complexes. Uh, here's one here made of crystal. Uh, and they represent the same thing, the, the same thing. They're points of creation, essentially. And very often, omphaloses or omphali are guarded by a huge great serpent or snake. Here's, here's a mural from Pompeii showing an omphalos guarded by a snake here. Okay? And what's interesting is that this omphalos of Egypt has a name. It's called the Benben Stone. And it's guarded by a bird, or a bird first comes to sit on it at the beginning of creation, known as the Benu bird. Now, although this is a crane in some traditions, in others, it's the ibis bird, bringing us back to this connection with Thoth. And this is the tomb guardian, who was in the area of the tomb of the birds. We met him on a few occasions. And he told us, that the caves were guarded by this giant snake called El Hanash. They called them El Kaf El Hanash, the caves of El Hanash. 
And he, he was so scared of this snake, and the reality of it, that he would never, ever, and had never, gone into the caves himself. And here's that snake. Now, this is not, we didn't encounter this, this is a mock-up, I, I have to say this. But, um, but this is probably what it would have looked like uh, if we had have encountered it, maybe. Uh, I don't think it's a real snake, I think it's some kind of guardian force that's said to exist beneath the plateau, just as the Sabians said themselves. But what's interesting is I found out one thing about El Hanash, and there's a, a prophecy. And it's a prophecy that says that beneath the plateau is the Hall of Records. Okay, this is probably a modern term that, that's been applied to an ancient legend. And that within this legend is a huge diamond. And that people will try and get to this diamond and learn the knowledge and wisdom of this forgotten race. But that everybody that will go will be blinded by this huge great snake, El Hanash. But that one day, towards the end of time, somebody will go there who will only be blinded in one eye, and that these people will learn that knowledge and wisdom, and they will gain powers that will affect creation in the outside world. And I found this a really fascinating story. So what is this diamond that's being talked about beneath the plateau? What is this? Is this some kind of omphalus, like the ancient Egyptians suggested was, was at Giza? Did it look something like this? I don't know. Well, I can't give you an absolute answer. All I can say is that in the tradition of Edgar Casey, I worked with a psychic in the, in the 1980s, 1990s, who's sadly no longer with us, whose name is Bernard, and he spoke about what Edgar Casey referred to as the Hall of Records, and he said, that they were a series of, of 12 chambers, very significant that number, focused around a central chamber in which was a huge great crystal within this 12-sided this room. And that this, this, these ancient peoples, known as the, what he called the elders, um, would take other crystals in here and communicate through this central crystal out into the cosmos and communicate with beings. I mean, you know, whether you see them as space aliens or whatever, it's up to you, Atlanteans or whatever. And, you know, this was a great story and, and it, it may be real, I don't know, but it fits exactly what this prophecy of El Hanash states. So, if this is correct and this crystal is there and it is the original Omphalos, it is the original Ben Ben stone, you know, what, is it a gateway? Is it a stargate? What, what does it actually represent? Okay. Now, yesterday I invited the question of whether we should be looking towards Cygnus for evidence of alien life between us here in this solar system and beyond it to the source of those cosmic rays, cosmic uh, um, Cygnus X3. Now, I said this originally, I think, in 2007, um, and something's happened recently that could well prove all of this correct. The Kepler space satellite was launched in 2009. Its idea was to look for what they called um, uh, exoplanets, um, you know, Earth-like planets existing out there. And Kepler was looking in a particular area of sky between Cygnus and the constellation of Lyra, just to the, the side of it. And in 2011, it picked up something very weird indeed. It was a star which they called KIC 8462852, obviously a very exciting name, but also known as Tabby's Star, after the, the first name of the actual discoverer, uh, um, a, a scientist, researcher into the field of exoplanets. And essentially what they found was that whereas an exoplanet is detected by the fact that it goes across the face of a star and they can detect the light curve just changing a little bit, only by a, a perhaps one degree, but they can tell that there's a planet and they can pick up so much information about the colors and you know the, 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 what's going on there that they can, they can tell what type of planet it is, how big it is, possibly even what the, the atmosphere is like. But in 2011, they picked up something very strange going across the face of this star. 
something that was dimming the light by up to 22%, and that it was irregular in shape. And scientific papers have been written that seriously suggest that the only possible explanation is that this is some kind of alien megastructure. Uh, that's the star itself, that's seen in, in, on X-ray. Now, what's an alien megastructure? Well, these were mentioned as far back as the 1930s in sci-fi novels, but it was this guy here, Freeman Dyson, who was born in 1923, who's still alive today, um, an incredible free thinker in the field of science and astrophysics. Um, in 1960, he did a thought experiment. Don't ask me what one of them is. But in this thought experiment, he came up with the fact that if a, a civilization grows, eventually it will absorb all the energy from its home planet and have to start taking further em energy directly from its star. And to do this, it would create these megastructures that would take the starlight directly and convert, convert it and send it back to the home planet. But what's so interesting is he said that this is what we should be looking for as evidence of extraterrestrial life because clearly these structures would be noticeable in the vicinity of stars. Uh, and he gave certain you know, reasons and things to look for. And it may well be that he's now been proved correct because the scientists are seriously considering that this star has actually got an alien megastructure around it. And I'm not sure exactly what it looks like. It's a, it's a, this is a normal um, main sequence star, uh, F, F, what they call F-class star, and there's something going around it that could be alien. And this is incredible, not simply because of this announcement, which could always be premature, they could find a natural explanation, but the fact that scientists are now accepting the idea that alien technology, advanced alien technology could exist out there and they're openly discussing this and I'm fascinated with the fact that the first possible evidence of this is coming from the Cygnus constellation, which is what I predicted. And that is it not possible that any alien civilization that could have created this is affected by the same cosmic rays that reach us here from Cygnus X3, which I talked about yesterday. They've been detected, they've been found and detected in particle facilities around the world in the 1980s, and since that I've written extensively about it. And these are unique. They affect evolution. They affected us. So somebody close to the source is going to be affected probably much earlier than that. Is that this alien technology? Is that the alien civilization behind them? Just might be. Okay. Latest developments on the Giza Gave controversy. We nearly finished this, but you need to hear about this. I thought it had all gone quiet. But at the end of last year, my good friend Nigel Skinner Simpson again comes out. He says, um, I, I think you should see this. I said, what? He said, well, there's a story about these three German researchers who got inside the Great Pyramid and scraped away at some of the hieroglyphs inside it. You probably heard this story. And stupidly, they put a video of themselves doing this up on YouTube. It became a national outcry in Egypt. All of the people, all the, all the Egyptians that helped them do this, and they did it perfectly legally, had all the documents, everything, have now been put in prison and are still there languishing in prison to this day. The three Germans were tried in their absence and were given sentences of five years each. But there's no extradition agreement between Germany and Egypt, so nothing basically can happen. You think, well, what's that got to do with the caves? Well, just before they went in and did that scraping, they went to one other place, the Tomb of the Birds, to, in their words, to confirm the theories of Andrew Collins. <laughs> oh, dear. Because... The Tomb of the Birds and my name are now being splattered about legal documents in Egypt, and suddenly people say, well, I'm, 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 forget the Great Pyramid for a second. What's this Tomb of the Birds and this, this English researcher discovering caves and 
in their opinion, wrongly I must state, excavating and surveying this site. And, you know, they, they get hold of my book. There's a picture of Sue, a picture of myself. And this is all in, in Arabic. And here we say, in the statement, the union confirms that this writ is due to the foreign researcher named Andrew Collins doing an archaeological survey and excavations on an informal basis without approval from the standing committee or any security approvals, which is a serious violation of the antiquities protection laws. Researcher has done excavations inside the Tomb of the Birds and published images. Oh dear, I'm in trouble. <laughs> um, now, okay, look, the situation is this. Um, Robert Bouval has actually been onto this, and he, the people that have issued writs against everybody that may have helped us get into those caves, right? And I mean, that's anybody that was in charge up to and including Zawi Hawass, basically, um, and are now answerable to the, the, the laws of Egypt and who knows what will happen. But I don't seem to be directly in the firing line. And I've had to create this timeline of, of everything that happened, when it happened. But this is big news. I mean, this, this was not just a national story that's continued to go and go within the press in Egypt, but it's right away across the, the Arab world. And this is a picture which uh, we shan't be sending to the Egyptian authorities. It's me and Nigel uh, surveying on the Giza Plateau. I showed you this earlier. Um, so... I've got to go back to Egypt for the first time since 2009, next September. I'm, I'm not sure quite what to do. Uh, do I just leave it and just go over there and just hope for the best, or do I try and make sure that I'm not going to get arrested on entry into Egypt? It, it, I'll be honest, it does concern me. Um, okay, we're nearly ended. What I've got now for you is a little movie that I put together in 2009 of myself, Nigel Skinner-Simpson, and uh, Sue discovering the caves, okay? If we have the lights down for this, because you know, it's quite dark. And I eventually put a version of this out up on YouTube, but the music was so dramatic in this, I thought this is just over the top. And I did debate whether I should or shouldn't show this to you, but I thought, oh, what the hell, let's just show it anyway. <laughs> So just excuse the overdramatic music and um, let's play this. Oh, again then. Not sure how old it is. I'm now switching to night vision. Ooh, interesting aroma in here. That's one. This is the way that it comes in. More from the canvas here. Here and in here, they found lots of mummified birds. Ah, oh. wow! And here's the rest of your two hundred birds. Wow! Oh my god! That's amazing. Okay, um, just a just a couple of points. Um, there is a DVD that was put together by my good friend Greg Little. Uh, which is available on the bookstore, which I'll be uh, there shortly, called The Lost Caves of De Giza, which is brilliantly done. It's everything, all the reconstructions of, of everything. Um, the, the book, Beneath the Pyramids, is available outside. Cygnus Mystery, all about uh, Cygnus and Giza. Gebekli Tepe. That'll do. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.
time it was the lights were low, low, low. I leaned back on my radio, low, low. some cat was laying down some rock and roll out of soul, he said. Then the lights on did seem to fight, fight, fight. came back like a small voice on a Switch on. 